everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology. My name is Miss Estrick and if you are new around here then I've been teaching for over 10 years and I'm here to help you get to grips with those challenging biology topics, improve your study skills, techniques and to help you get the grades that you deserve. And linked to that in this video what I'm going to be going through is part two of my practical video. I've already gone through in this video up here, or actually it'll probably pop up up here, how to revise for the practicals in general. But so many of you have requested this, so I've brought it to you today. I'm also going to go through all of the required practicals that are coming up in exams 2022 telling you the sorts of things that you need to know and how to prepare. Now, if you do want any extra help with the consolidation, learning the content, then check out some of my resources. The most popular one at the moment is my Active Recall Workbook, which you can see here, which tests all your knowledge. It helps you to remember the information as well and get you ready for those exam questions. But for now, let's get into the required practicals. So this is for AQA A-Level Biology and they have stated which required practicals are coming up on each paper and it will only be those required practicals. You might get other general practical skills to do with picking equipment and analysing data and evaluating methods, but it will only be these practicals. So let's take a look at which ones are coming up on each paper. Paper one, it states it will be required practical three, six and one. Paper two is going to be required practical nine and paper three is required practical two. So what I'm going to do is for all of those, I'm going to go through the common questions that typically come up and therefore give you an indication of what you actually have to practice and revise for these required practicals. Now, I have actually done a video that is more generic on how to revise for the required practicals, showing you two tables that you need to cross-reference. I'm not going to repeat that again today, so if you haven't already watched it, I'll link it at the start of the video, but also at the end. So, required practical three is titled The Production of a Dilution Series of a Solute to Produce a Calibration Curve. So, there we go. We've got two skills already, a dilution series, producing a calibration curve, and then being able to identify the water potential of the plant tissue. So this is the method from the AQA handbook, but they do specify that just because this is in the handbook, it does not mean that is what is going to be on the exam as the method. But it's a way to give you a general idea of the typical pieces of equipment, and I'm going to pick out some of the key points that you could be questioned on if you are given a method, or you could be asked to suggest how you would do a certain step. So first of all, you need to have a range of different concentrated solutions for, in this case, a sucrose, but it could be a salt solution. And that's where the dilution series comes in. And we're going to come on to that skill. You might be asked which variables you have to control. And that's why in the method here, they've said, have it set at 30 degrees C and control that. Because if this is all to do with osmosis, any factors that could affect osmosis, the rate of it, need to be controlled. So that would be the shape and um, the size of the potato chips, because that affects the surface area to volume ratio. That is the temperature, as we already mentioned as well. Um, we're deliberately changing the concentration solution, so therefore the concentration gradient is what is being changed. Now, you could be asked, why do you have to remove the potato peels? And that is because you'd have a different thickness and therefore you're going to affect the diffusion distance. You also are told to dry the potato chips with a paper towel before you weigh it. And again, when you record the final mass and it says do not squeeze. Now, you have to pat them dry with a paper towel to remove any water that might have been removed when the cells were cut. And we only want to know the mass of the potato chip, meaning the water inside the cells of that potato chip, not any that is on the outside. So that's why we pat it dry. We don't squeeze because that then actually cause some damage to the cells, cause them to break, and then water from inside the cells would come out. Um, same idea at the end. That's why we pat it dry to make sure no water on the outside rather than the water actually within the cells is going to be included and we don't squeeze. so We don't cause any damage. Um, you could be asked, why do you calculate the percentage change in mass instead of just the change in mass? 
and that is to account for any slight differences in the initial mass. So how you actually then would do a dilution series, I'm focusing here on the math skill. If you want the full method and you want all of this in more detail, I'll link my video up here, which goes through dilution series in detail. So check that out if you're not sure. But here I'm just gonna show you how you could calculate the volume of the previous sucrose concentration solution you'd need to transfer over and what volume of water you would need to dilute that in. So in this particular example, these were the concentrations that we were told were going to be made. You could be given any though. And what you need to use is this formula here. C1 times V1 equals C2 times V2. So C1 is your starting concentration. And we're told here that you need to use a one molar decimeter cubed sucrose solution. So our C1 is one molar. V1 is the volume of that solution that you need to transfer over. So that is one of the elements we need to work out. C2 is the final concentration of the solution you're making. And we've been told that we need to make a concentration of 0.2 moles per decimeter cubed. So that is our C2. And the volume V2 is the final volume, which we're told here is 20 centimeters cubed. Now, that part is V1 that we need to work out, which is the volume of the first solution we need to transfer over. But to make up the actual diluted solution, it is that volume and we need to know the volume of water to dilute it in. And that's where I use a second formula. The final volume, which is V2, needs to be the volume of distilled water that you're diluting in, plus the volume of the original solution you're transferring over. So we're going to need to use both of those because we need to work out V1 for this box and the volume of distilled water for that box. So in this example, I've rearranged the formula to make V1 the subject, and then we have got our C2 times V2 divided by C1, and that gives us 4. Then we can work out um, the volume of distilled water, because it would be 20 minus 4, so it's going to be 16 centimetres cubed of water. So that's how you do it, and I've got the rest of the answers here if you do want to pause and have a check, um, having a go at that yourself. Each time the C1 remained the same, the V2 remained the same, but the C2 is changing because we want to make different concentrations each time. Now, the other skill that you were told is, as well as the dilution series, you need to be able to come up with a calibration curve. And what that means is, it's not actually literally always a curve, it could be a straight line of best fit. But this is where you would plot your mean percentage change in mass against the concentration of the solution. And you would then plot all of your results. And the purpose of this is for you to then be able to work out the concentration inside of your potato, if it's a potato that you're told. It could be any plant, they've said. So that is what they would ask. And the way you work this out is, where your line of best fit hits zero on the change in mass, that is the concentration inside of your potato cells. And that is because if there's no change in mass, that means there was no net movement of water, and therefore the water potential inside of the cell was the same as the water potential outside of the cell. And in this case, we're looking at concentration of sodium chloride solution. So if that was the sodium chloride solution in which there was no change in mass, that is the concentration of sodium chloride in the potato. So that is how you'd work that out. So those are some of the key things for that required practical. Now let's move on to required practical six. And this is the use of aseptic techniques to investigate the effect of antimicrobial substances on microbial growth. So the key thing here is aseptic techniques. That's what most of the question is going to link to, as well as maths. So I've got, again, the method that they give you from AQA. You can pause this, have a read through, but the main things to focus on are the aseptic techniques. So some of those would include having your Bunsen burner close to the edge of the heat proof mat, 
and that means you are then able to work close to the Bunsen burner and that means that the air that your plate might be exposed to when you slightly open the lid it's going to be sterilized by the heat from that Bunsen burner. Point number six we can see here, wash your hands thoroughly with liquid hand soap or wash and then dry your hands using a paper towel. Now this is a point that they're really particular on in the mark scheme. You will not get the mark if you say wash your hands. You would have to say wash your hands with soap for that to be counted as an aseptic technique. You might have also talked about um, disinfecting the work surface. Here they're working on a plastic sheet and they're disinfecting that. Any of the equipment that you're going to be using needs to be sterilized as well. And metal equipment can be sterilized in the roaring flame of the Bunsen burner. If it's glass equipment, um, like a spreader, that would be sterilized beforehand in an autoclave, which is a really hot oven. Um, and that's why it says in point number 14, take your sterile plastic spreader. It's already been sterilized in an autoclave. Now, another piece of aseptic technique would be remove the lid as little as possible. And that is to prevent any microbes in the air from landing on your plate. Now, all of those I've just gone through are descriptions of aseptic technique. Flame in the neck of the bottle is another one just there. But you could be asked to describe and explain. So the description would be what I just went through, saying what the aseptic technique is. The explanation is saying why you need to do that stage. And it's always the same two key ideas. You are trying to kill any other bacteria, or it could be fungi as well, to prevent contamination on your plate and to make sure you're maintaining a pure culture of whichever bacteria you are growing. So that is why. If it was an even longer answer question, or if they asked you why it's important you don't have contaminations on your plate, it's because you don't want the other bacteria to outcompete the bacteria you are growing. So they are also gonna be using the oxygen, the nutrients dissolved in the agar, they could outcompete your bacteria and prevent them from growing. Also, it could be a pathogenic strain that grows and that's really harmful. So those are the aseptic techniques. There are some other questions that come up commonly, but I'm going to come to that towards the end of this practical. The math skill that you can get is calculating the inhibition zone. And that is the clear ring you get around the paper discs. And that is where the bacteria has been killed. And you would have to say the bacteria has been killed, not just saying it's not grown as much. It has been killed in that area. Now, really, you should also have a control paper disc. And the control experiment paper disc would be one of the paper discs just soaked in water, not an antibiotic, to prove that it isn't the paper disc itself killing the bacteria. Now, in this case, we're having a look at the math skill, though, which is working out the inhibition zone of bacteria F. So you would need to, first of all, measure the diameter, so all the way across. And I'm saying in this one, it's five millimeters. Then often they'll either tell you to use 3.14 for pi, or if they don't, use your pi button on the calculator. But the area of a circle, which is what our inhibition zone is, is pi r squared. So in this case, our area of the inhibition zone would be 19.6 millimetres. That shouldn't have been changed to centimetres there. So that is millimetres squared. So here, as I said, are some of the common questions that come up. We've already talked about the first one, describing the aseptic techniques or even explaining them. Also, as I've said here, giving a reason why aseptic technique is important. So those two we've already talked about. But this is one of the ones that I hadn't mentioned that I'd said I'd come to. Why must the plates be incubated at 25 degrees C when the optimum is 35 or 37? And that is to prevent the excessive growth of bacteria and potential pathogens from growing. You could also be asked, why do you not sellotape all the way around the lid? And that is to make sure that oxygen can still enter into the plate to make sure that anaerobic bacteria don't grow, which are often pathogenic. You could also be asked to comment on which antibiotic is the most effective. And this is when you would then look at which inhibition zone is the largest 
That is the most effective because it has killed the most bacteria. So those are your key ideas for required practical six. Then we get to required practical one investigation into the effect of a named variable on the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction. Now you can see from that title, it is very vague. And that is why for this one, you do not have to learn a method because it could be any variable on any enzyme controlled reaction that they give you in the exam. So they don't expect you to learn a method. So let me show you what they could assess you on. And this is the table that I referred to right at the start, where you have in your specification the apparatus and techniques that they could assess you on, and they actually link the required practicals table to this one, telling you all of the skills that could come up. And for required practical one, where I've got those fingers pointing, those are the ones that you could be assessed on. So you won't have to know a method, but they could ask you to suggest an appropriate piece of apparatus to measure something. So if in the reaction, the product is a gas, they might ask you to suggest an appropriate piece of equipment to measure a volume of gas, and that could be a gas syringe. If the variable that they are measuring is pH, then you could suggest to use a pH data logger and so on. Um, so that's what you need to be familiar with, pieces of equipment that would be appropriate to use to measure different variables. They've also linked it to this one, use of appropriate instrumentation to record quantitative measurements, such as a colorimeter or a photometer, so a light meter. So for this one, maybe it could be the rate of reaction. You have a color change where it goes from a clear see-through or transparent solution to a cloudy endpoint. So you could use a light meter here. And when that light can no longer pass through, you could say that is the end point of your reaction. It also links to serial dilutions again. So potentially you can have a serial dilutions question. I highly doubt it because required practical three links to serial dilutions and that is in the same paper. So I don't think you'd have that link to this practical. You've also got use of qualitative reagents to identify biological molecules. So if the reaction was, let's say, starch being digested by amylase um, into a sugar, then we could have the use of starch to see when you no longer have that blue-black colour anymore. So just make sure you know all of those tests for the different biological molecules. And then the last one is ICT, such as computer modelling or data loggers. Um, and that's where I think it probably linked to pH, so a pH meter as a data logger. So for example, if it was an enzyme controlled reaction where it was lipase that was being hydrolyzed, that's hydrolyzed into glycerol and fatty acids. Acids are acidic, so as that reaction continues, the solution will become more acidic. So those are the sorts of things that they could question you on linked to this table. So you also could get some math skills. So I've picked out a few exam questions linked to this. So we've got here a particular example of this required practical. So we've got hydrogen peroxide and we've got catalase and that produces water and oxygen. And they've given us the method here, but I'm just focusing on the maths point here. So you had to use this data to work out the rate of reaction. And lots of people found this one quite difficult because they know rate of reaction to be one divided by time taken. But we don't have the time taken for the entire reaction. We've only been given the time for production of a certain volume of gas. And what we can see here is the fastest time is six seconds. So we're gonna have to say that that is the fastest rate of reaction. So we'll call that one, meaning that is as fast as it gets. Everything else will be a slower rate of reaction. So it'll be a smaller number than one. So the way that you actually had to work this one out was six divided by the time taken. And there we can see all of the answers that you would have got at the top. It also links to control variables again. So thinking about whichever variable you're given, the variables that affect enzyme controlled reactions are pH, temperature, substrate concentration, enzyme concentration and inhibitors. 
So if you had to state another variable to control, it would be any of those that aren't the one that's being used. Probably not the inhibitors, but all of the others you could use. You could also be given a graph or you could be asked to plot a graph and then draw a tangent to work out rate of reactions. So tangents are a really common math skill linked to enzyme rate of reaction graphs. So here's an example where we could have a look at how you would actually do that. So we can see here we've been asked to determine the rate of reaction at 10 minutes. You wouldn't be able to just calculate the gradient of the line here to work out the rate of reaction because the line is curved. So we need to have a straight line to be able to work out the rate of reaction. So that's why we have to draw a tangent and we're told to do it 10 minutes. So at 10 minutes, that is where our tangent line needs to touch and you'd use your ruler to go. So it touches there and then you'd have a straight line making sure the angle between the original curve and your tangent line is equal. And then you calculate the gradient of the tangent line. So there was one mark in this question to have a tangent drawn, and then a second mark to get an answer within that range. So require practical nine, this is the only one that it states is coming up on paper two. And this is linked to respiration. So an investigation into the effect of the named variable on the rate of respiration of cultures of single celled organisms. So basically it's probably going to be yeast. It could be algae as well, but normally this one is with yeast. Now the setup I've got here isn't with yeast, but it's just to demonstrate some of the key concepts of how this could be assessed. So this here is a respirometer. If you want all of the details on a respirometer, I'll link my respirometer video, the required practical one up here. But essentially what you have is your respiring organism. Now, although it says maggots here, it would be with yeast for your one. And this is our experimental tube with the maggots in that will be respiring. You have a control tube on the other side where you just have glass beads and you have soda lime, or it could be sodium hydroxide liquid that is there to absorb carbon dioxide. This chamber is fully sealed. So what will be happening is whichever organism you have, as it respires, it will be absorbing the oxygen from the air by diffusion, and it'll be producing carbon dioxide gas in equal volumes. However, that carbon dioxide gas is then absorbed by the soda lime. So oxygen goes in, carbon dioxide comes out, but then it's absorbed into that liquid or solid. So as a result, the gas volume inside this tube will start to decrease. The gas volume inside this tube should stay the same because nothing is respiring. So that means that because the gas volume is decreasing, the pressure will decrease in this tube as well. And comparatively, the pressure will be lower in the experimental tube compared to the control tube. And that will cause this red liquid to move towards the experimental tube. And the way that this measures the rate of respiration is we can see how far that red liquid moves over a period of time. And that will be used to represent the rate of respiration. Now that, as I said, is with maggots, but here's showing you a way that they've done it with yeast before. So you've got your yeast culture inside of a conical flask, but inside of that, you have it inside of a separate container. This time you're just told it's an alkaline that's going to absorb the oxygen. So in this required practical, this could be measuring the rate of anaerobic or aerobic respiration. So look carefully to see which gas they say the solution that they've added in is going to absorb. Because for this one, they tell you yeast can respire aerobically or anaerobically. A student used apparatus shown to measure the rate of respiration in yeast, but it's going to be anaerobic respiration because the oxygen from the gas in the conical flask is going to be absorbed. So you don't have to memorize a method for this experiment because there's a whole range of different methods that would work for that title. And they said a variable that is changing. So it could be temperature that changes, the concentration of your yeast. Um, so it could be different variables that they change. 
So it's not likely you'll get a question on that. It's more likely they would give you a method and you have to answer why they did certain things. So for example, suggest one reason why it was important that the student left the apparatus for one hour after the yeast culture reached a constant temperature. So sometimes they wouldn't emphasize reach a constant temperature and the mark might be for all the gases to reach the same temperature and therefore the same starting pressure and for everything to equilibrate. But for this one, they've said it's not that reason, it's something else. And for this one, it will be because you need at least an hour for all of the oxygen in the gas in the conical flask to be absorbed by that alkaline to make the conditions anaerobic. Then we're told during her investigation, the coloured liquid moved to the right. Explain why it moved to the right. That question always comes up if you have a setup like this. So if you do have a respirometer, which is this setup, which is this setup, and we'll have a look at another one, then you will be asked either which direction will the coloured liquid move and why, or you'll be told which direction and have to explain why. And you always have to talk about the change in gas volume and the change in gas pressure and what caused those changes. So here was the answer for this one. The anaerobic respiration produced carbon dioxide that would increase the volume of gas and therefore the pressure. For the way around that we had it in this one where it was aerobic respiration, it'd be the opposite idea. We said that the gas volume decreased and therefore the gas pressure decreased. So here we have the final little bit, which is another thing that you are pretty much likely to get if you had that set up, and that would be calculating the rate. So this time the student found that the coloured liquid moved 1.5 centimetres in 24 hours. So we've got the distance travelled, the time, which will make our rate. The diameter of the lumen, which is the hole of the capillary tube, was one millimetre. So to work out the volume of gas produced, you need to know how to calculate the volume of a cylinder because this liquid is moving through a cylinder. But they've actually told you here that is pi r squared times length. And they've said use pi to be 3.14 and the length is the distance it moved, 1.5. So for this one, the answer was 4.9 times 10 to the minus Four. So you'd need to do, as we said, pi r squared times the length, but we were given the diameter, so it would be pi times 0.5 squared times 1.5. That gives you the volume of gas, but we need to know it per hour. So divide by 24, and that's how we get to our answer. So finally, required practical two, which is on paper three. Preparation of stained squashes of cells from plant root tips. Set up and use of an optical microscope to identify the stages of mitosis in these stained squashes and a calculation of mitotic index. So again, quite a few different skills and mathematical elements that they could assess. So once again, I've taken this from the AQA handbook, but that doesn't mean it's the only method that could ever come up but I've done it to pick out a few key concepts of what you could be assessed on for this required practical. So just like with all the others, you aren't expected to know a method off by heart. It's knowing, could you suggest appropriate apparatus to use if you had to, or if they gave you a method, could you justify why they used the apparatus or why they did a particular step? So they're testing your understanding of the practicals, not a memory of a method. So some of the things here from the equipment list, um, knowing about a stain, that is essential for this required practical. And I've put that in bold here as well, or in a box. So you could be asked, why do you stain your sample? And the answer for that is to make the chromosomes visible. Because the whole point of this experiment is identify the stages of mitosis, and the way you identify the stages of mitosis is based on the appearance of the chromosomes. So stain the chromosomes would be the answer. Why do you use a mounted needle? That often gets asked. That is to lower down the cover slip to make sure you don't get any air bubbles. Why would you use a scalpel? Whenever it's a microscope 
preparation question, you would use a scalpel to get a very, very thin slice of your specimen. And that is important because it has to be thin enough for light to pass through to be able to create an image. So to get a thin slice so light can pass through. Um, why would you use the very, very tip of the root? That is a common question. The answer for that would be, that is where mitosis is occurring. And if we want to observe mitosis, it has to be a location where mitosis is occurring. The final thing I've highlighted down here is, you could be asked, why in this stained squash do you apply pressure pushing down, but you shouldn't slide the cover slip? So the reason that we press down is to make sure we get one layer of cells. And that's important so that light can pass through. You don't slide your cover slip because if you did that, as you slide the cover slip, you might drag along a layer of cells and then you'd have a double layer or a triple layer of cells, but also you might damage the chromosomes as well. So those are the key things linked to the equipment and the method. The other thing you could be asked though is to calculate the mitotic index. And that's basically a percentage. So you're looking at the number of cells in mitosis divided by the total number of cells times 100. But you could be asked things on how do you standardize and how would you improve the accuracy of your answer? So a way to standardize and improve your accuracy could be when you are looking at one field of view, which is what we have here, just one particular part that you're looking at through the microscope, you have some cells which you can only see part of them and sometimes you can only see a very little amount. So you could say to standardize the method, only count the whole cells and therefore you'll get a more accurate answer. Now for this one, if we were doing our mitotic index, I've said there's two cells that are going through mitosis. The way we can tell that is the chromosomes are visible as thread-like structures rather than just as this dotty mass of the nucleus. So that's how you can tell. And I said there's nine cells in total. So our mitotic index is 22.2%. Now I have seen it come up in exam questions as well, where as well as the standardization method, which just to point out wasn't used for this, that's why it says nine cells rather than one, two, three, four, five cells. Um, other things could be you should repeat but on multiple fields of views, because therefore you have more samples and it'll be more representative. Um, also, you could recount to check the accuracy of the counting. Other questions you could get, though, might ask you to identify which stage the cell is under in mitosis. So for this one, it would be prophase because the chromosomes are visible, but they aren't arranged in any particular position yet. Whereas this one here is anaphase, we can see that the chromatids have been separated and are being pulled to the opposite poles, which is what happens in anaphase. So that is it. That is my summary of some of the key questions, some of the key things through the method for each of the required practicals. If you have found this helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you do have any more questions linked to this, then please add it in the comments and I'll try my best to get back to you.